previously on the keys of time. We now have the keys that are necessary to start to systematically unveil the Bible's chronology. The first two keys revealed the divinely ordained blueprint or framework for time, which governs the progression of God's plan. Keys one and two basically say that the blueprint is a week of seven days of 1,000 years each. The next two keys resulted in the discovery of God's redemption chronology, which exists alongside the Bible's actual chronology. Key 3 says, at the end of every jubilee cycle of 49 actual years, God adds a special 50th year of grace. This must be a measurement in the redemption chronology. Key 4 is the principle of unreckoned time, which says that God does not count times when his people's sin causes his plan of redemption to be suspended. This is convincingly revealed by the 479 completed years recorded in 1 Kings 6.1, which are 131 years short of the actual time. Now, the total times of servitude are also 131 years. So if they are subtracted from the total time, this gives exactly 479 years. The only alternative to this solution is to force the periods in Judges and Acts 13.20, which add up to 610 years, to fit into the 479 years of 1 Kings 6.1. This involves torturing the scriptures. On the other hand, when the key of redemption chronology with its unreckoned times is accepted, there is a perfect harmony of all the stated times. Again, this requires the existence of a separate redemption chronology in which the years out of fellowship are not counted. These latter keys define how time is reckoned on the redemption chronology. They are like counting the number of days of pay owed to an employee. Weekends are not reckoned because work is suspended then, that's key four. But bank holidays, are which are like jubilees, are added as extra days, even though no work was done. Hence, they are days of grace. And this corresponds to key number three. So whereas keys one and two define the structure of time that governs the redemption chronology, keys three and four tell us how redemption time, as counted by God, relates to actual time, as counted by man. This is important because the progression of time within God's overall blueprint is according to redemption time, not actual time. Jeremiah started to prophesy in the 13th year of Josiah. We read that in Jeremiah chapter 1, the first two verses. The words of Jeremiah, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Jeremiah 25.3 says, From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the 23rd year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. This start of Jeremiah's ministry was in 628 BC. This is a very significant date, as it marks the start of a special period of 40 years of God's final warnings to Judah which were from 628 B.C. to 588 B.C. After which it would be too late for them to repent, for then judgment would be certain. In 588 B.C. was when the final siege of Jerusalem began, which marked the start of the 70 years of desolations of Jerusalem and the land. Jeremiah 25 goes on to say that Judah had rejected these prophetic warnings and as a result God would increase the level of judgment from servitude to desolation. That's in Jeremiah 25 verse 4 to 7. And the Lord has sent you all his servants the prophets again and again 
but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds, and dwell on the land which the Lord has given you and your forefathers for ever and ever. And do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands, and I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, in order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. According to Jeremiah 25, verse 8 and 9, this extra judgment, which was for rejecting God's words through Jeremiah, would be a further invasion by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against its inhabitants, and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them, and make them a horror, and a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. And this would have the result, described in Jeremiah 25:11, that this whole land shall be a desolation for 70 years. This came to pass in 588 to 518 BC. Ezekiel prophetically acted out as a sign for Israel the coming siege of Jerusalem which would mark the start of her desolation judgment. Then he prophetically acted out a sign demonstrating the cause of these judgments. This was in two parts. First, 390 days which represented 390 years of Israel's sin immediately followed by 40 days representing 40 years of Judah's sin. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 4 verses 1 to 6. It says, You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you, and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it, set camps against it also, and place battering rams against it all around. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate, and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie also on your left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of days. That is, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when... You have completed them, lie on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. This symbolic action pointed to a period of 390 years of sin, followed by a distinct period of 40 years of sin, both of which result in the final siege of Jerusalem. There is general agreement that the 40 years of Jeremiah's warnings to Israel are the 40 years of Judah's sin in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. Accurately locating these 40 years of Judah's sin enables us to locate the associated 390 years of Israel's sin in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 5. Thus together there are 390 plus 40, that is, 430 years leading up to this judgment. Therefore, since the final 40 years are from 628 to 588 BC,
the 390 years of Israel's sin must be from 1018 BC to 628 BC. As we will see, these measurements agree with and confirm the chronology we have built up by following the Bible's plain meaning. Such a chronology is known as a long chronology for the kings. Long chronologies are 40 to 60 years longer than the more commonly used short chronologies, which are obtained by squeezing the biblical data against their plain meaning into our present understanding of Assyrian history. This shortening of the chronology is based on two assumptions. First, that the fragmentary Assyrian records are more reliable than the far more complete biblical record. And secondly, that two synchronisms in the Assyrian records connect their king Shalmaneser with Ahab and Jehu of Israel. These synchronisms along with the currently accepted Assyrian chronology, force a shortening of the biblical chronology by at least 40 years. There are good reasons to believe these synchronisms have been misinterpreted. If this is indeed the case, then it's possible to uphold both the biblical and Assyrian records as correct. In any case, in our approach to Bible chronology, we are submitting to the Bible as the Word of God, and it is disappointing that even much evangelical scholarship follows the shorter chronology, subjecting the biblical record to the Assyrian rather than the other way around. A further confirmation that all the short chronologies are contrary to God's Word is the fact that they run aground on the rock of Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, for they cannot make any sense of the 390 years. According to them, the time from the building of Solomon's temple to its destruction is well under 390 years, so these short chronologies contradict the Bible at this point. Care must be taken to interpret Ezekiel 4, as mistakes are commonly made here. One is to identify Israel in Ezekiel 4 with the northern kingdom, which is understandable, as both Israel and Judah are mentioned together. However, this northern kingdom of Israel did not last anything like 390 years, so it cannot refer to the northern kingdom. Now, generally in the Bible, Israel refers to the nation as a whole, that is, all twelve tribes. Moreover, any other time Ezekiel speaks of Israel, he is speaking of the nation as a whole, not just of the northern kingdom, for the northern kingdom did not even exist when Ezekiel gave his prophecy. We can even see this in the immediate context. See Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 3 and 13, and Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 4. Then get yourself an iron plate, and set it up as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face toward it, so that it is under siege, and besiege it. This is a sign to the house of Israel. Then the Lord said, Thus will the sons of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations, where I will banish them. Take again some of them and throw them into the fire and burn them in the fire. From it a fire will spread to all the house of Israel. Thus, the initial cause of judgment was the collective sin of the whole nation of Israel over 390 years. This sin made the 70 years of servitude to Babylon certain. This explains why, in Josiah's 18th year, which is five years after the 390 years had ended, when Josiah inquired of the Lord, having become aware of the cumulative sin of the nation, as, as we see in 2 Chronicles 34, 21. Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us, because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He was then told by Huldah the prophetess 
that judgment was unavoidable because of their worship of idols and other gods. We see that in 2 Chronicles 34, 22 to 25. So Hilkiah and those whom the king had told went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokhath, the son of Hazra, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke to her regarding this. She said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the curses written in the book which they have read in the presence of the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and have burnt incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands, therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place, and it shall not be quenched. The three ninety years of Israel's sin resulted in the initial judgment of the servitude to Babylon. Then, the forty years of Judah's sin that followed resulted in the greater judgment of the desolations of the land by Babylon. The cause of this second judgment is laid at the feet of Judah, the tribe of the house of David, who ruled from Jerusalem, and who sinned in a special way over the final forty years of testing. This was perfectly fulfilled, for the forty years of Judah's sin were the forty years during which Jeremiah warned the kings in Jerusalem, who were of Judah, of course, of the need to repent and submit to the Babylonian yoke, or else worse judgment would fall. Since the kings of Judah rejected his message for forty years, these were forty years of sin, and they resulted in a greater judgment coming upon the land, the desolations. Thus, the forty years of Judah's sin made the desolation certain. Their end point was the final siege of Jerusalem in 588 BC, when the forty years of testing had run out, and Israel had passed the point of no return. So, the two successive periods of 390 years and 40 years reflect perfectly the two successive judgments of the servitude and the desolations both of which lasted 70 years. Jeremiah began his ministry just after the 390 years had finished and just as the 40 years were beginning. Thus, he told Israel that the servitude to Babylon was unavoidable, and so they should accept it. But he also pleaded with them that they should repent, lest the greater judgment of the desolations should come upon them. These two consecutive periods of 390 and 40 years span the whole time period that we've been studying. And therefore they allow us to check and confirm that we have found the correct chronology for this whole period. We have discovered the end point for the 390 years, which is also the start of the 40 years. So we must now deduce the logical starting point for the 390 years. Based on the principle of jubilee forgiveness, it could not have started before the dedication of the temple. The glory filling the temple during that great jubilee demonstrated that God had forgiven all of Israel's sins up to that point, and so that by his mercy she could start afresh. 
This is the whole point of Jubilee. It's unthinkable that God would reckon years of sin before this point. Now many assume the years of Israel's sin began with the start of the divided kingdom when the northern kingdom rebelled against Judah. This theory might have merit if Ezekiel was referring to the northern kingdom when he used the term Israel in Ezekiel 4. But we've already seen that this was not so. He was talking of the nation of Israel as a whole. So, did Israel's sin in this great jubilee cycle start when the kingdom was divided after Solomon's death? No. The Bible is clear that the division was a judgment resulting from previous sinning during Solomon's reign. Thus, these 430 years of sin must have started in Solomon's reign. To decide when the 430 years of sin began, we need to determine the nature of this sin which led up to and resulted in the desolation of the land and the temple. The key passages are 1 Kings chapter 9 verse 1 to 9 and 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verses 11 to 22 which describe God's second appearance to Solomon immediately after the account of his dedication of the temple which is in 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 6 1 to 7 10. 1 Kings chapter 9 verses 3 and 6 to 9 say the Lord said to him to Solomon I have heard your prayer and supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, the temple, which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, and have embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them, therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. Having established his presence, glory, and his name in their midst, through his consecrated temple, God warned Solomon about the two consequences of serving other gods the destruction of the temple and their expulsion from the land. This perfectly answers the question about the nature of the sin of Ezekiel 4. It is the sin against the presence of God in their midst, in the temple, by their worshipping other gods. This sin ultimately resulted in God's glory leaving the temple as recorded in Ezekiel 10, which then led to its destruction. Thus, the 430 years of sin are connected to the temple, and so must begin after its dedication. It is appropriate that they end with the final siege that led to the temple's destruction and the expulsion of Israel from her land. Jeremiah, who prophesied in the final phase of this time, often used the, des the descriptive language of this foundational prophecy to warn about the soon coming judgments. Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Today I want to introduce you to uh, what I believe is a very special book called The Keys of Time. 
a revelation of Bible chronology, revealing the keys by which you can unlock the treasure chest of God's Word concerning its revelation of time. And so we start, you see, by looking at the major keys that will unlock this treasure chest, like the fact that all time is based on the creation week and one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and we look into the Jubilee and how that also unlocks how God measures time and we look at the principle of unreckoned time and as we see the whole revelation of God in history and time fit together perfectly we will get out of this we'll get a revelation of the glory of God as the sovereign Lord of time the God who is working out his purposes of grace in his perfect time according to his redemption timetable so through this book God will impart to you a rich understanding of the times giving you a fresh revelation of the special time in which we're now living near the end of the age 